if you were stuck in a country where bloodthirsty revolutionaries have toppled the government and are hunting down anyone that gets in their way, what would you do? America is in complete anarchy, and if you don't escape the country, you'll never make it out alive. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the purgers in Forever Purge. America is about to be destroyed. Juan and his wife Adela are riding a bus to a group shelter, where they'll wait out the country's most violent day of the year. For 12 hours, all crimes are legalized, and if anyone is caught outside while it happens, they're guaranteed to get murdered. The couple and their friend arrive at the shelter to find a bunker full of some of the poorest people in the area. Walking inside, the couple here notice an emergency broadcast has started playing on the TV, and the others gather around to listen as they're told that the purge is about to start. During this time, all the emergency services will not be available, and with that, an alarm rings out, signaling that the purge has officially begun. Throughout the city, people start to celebrate as they brutally slaughter each other, leaving bodies all over town. It's absolute carnage, and the couple wait nervously in the shelter, but after 12 long hours, an alarm starts blaring to signal the end of the purge. The shutters open, and everyone inside starts cheering. They think they're all safe, but they have no idea that this purge will be unlike any they've ever seen. Later that day, Adela here arrives at her workplace, but notices several of her co-workers are missing. Curious, she goes outside hoping to find them, but discovers a cage in the middle of the alley with a goat inside. Trying to free the animal, she reaches in and manages to pull the release lever, but it's a trap. Suddenly, these bars shoot up, locking her in place, and she's flipped over on top of the cage. Two purgers wearing rabbit costumes come out of a dumpster, and she begs them for help, but one of the men tells her that this is the forever purge. No one can stop it, and it's just getting started. Okay, of course this was a trap. This is an urban environment, and people don't just leave their goats inside 300-pound cages in the middle of the city. It's completely outside of its natural environment, and that's why setting this goat free is the stupidest thing she could possibly do. As soon as it's released, it's going to wander around and eventually cross a busy street where it will be run over by a car. This woman is also right in the middle of her work shift, only two hours after the purge has ended. That means even if she managed to save this goat, she had no plan on what to do next. This woman spent plenty of time inspecting the cage, but looking at this chain on the side, it's not hard to figure out how this thing is designed. The lever pulls on the chain, which rotates the gear and swings the door forward. She should have realized that standing right in front of the gate while you try to open it is a pretty f***ing bad idea, and with that kind of brain activity, it's no wonder she fell for this trap. Now, you might be thinking that Adela here should have no reason to suspect this would happen. The purge is over, and nobody's allowed to murder anyone after 7 a.m., but she really should have known better. If you look here at the TV screen, you'll see that one of the headlines is about a man who was arrested for celebrating the purge too early. When you let 330 million people kill each other every year, there must be thousands of cases where people don't follow the rules. As you can see in the background, there are no policemen or military out in the streets, and all services are concentrated on cleaning up the bodies from the city, so it wouldn't be hard for a bunch of drunk purgers to keep killing the next day. Now as for this trap, what's disappointing here is that the woman didn't even try to escape. If you look here along the steel poles, there aren't any holes along the sides that would tell us there's a locking mechanism that's keeping her pinned down. If she had just tried pushing up on the metal bar here, she might have been able to get out and roll off of the opposite side of the cage. And since she didn't close the shutters to her workplace, she could easily run back inside to find help. But there was one way she could have used her downtime which would have been much more satisfying. Mythic Heroes is a multi-civilization idle RPG game, and it's perfect for those who want to play strategically but don't have the time. And with AFK mode, your heroes will level up and grow stronger even when you're busy doing other things. You can use the Auto Ultimate feature to clear campaigns at high speed and the Auto Assault function to automatically enter the next level with minimal clicks. That way you can progress quickly and collect rewards even when you're busy escaping a death trap. So you can enjoy the game no matter what kind of playstyle you have. It has so many great features. You can choose heroes from various civilizations around the globe played in nine mythical worlds. You can even collect SSR and UR heroes, including Zeus, the Greek god of the sky and thunder, and Tamamo, the legendary Japanese fox spirit. Each hero has exclusive skills and weapons, and by enhancing their abilities and combining those with powerful artifacts and divinities, you can outsmart your enemies in epic battles. 
Finding the most strategic ways to arrange your team's factions and formations will be the key to winning even the toughest fight. Mythic Heroes is also a great platform to play with your friends. You can not only team up with or challenge them, but also hire their strongest heroes and use them in your battle. It's time to experience a next-gen AAA game from your mobile phone. Click the link in the description box to download the app and automatically receive a $200 Mythic Heroes gift pack after downloading the game. And don't forget to choose your favorite SSR hero to start your journey. Thank you Mythic Heroes for sponsoring this video. Adela here is completely helpless, but that's when someone sneaks up and attacks the Purgers from behind. It's her boss, and the man fights one of them with a metal pipe before he brutally caves his head in. Running up to save her, he lifts the bars off her neck and frees her from the cage, but he's suddenly attacked by the second perjur who throws him against the wall. Adela here grabs the man from behind, dragging his head directly beneath the spike trap and her boss activates it, killing the perjur on the spot. They've managed to survive, but their day is about to get a lot worse. The police arrive at the scene with their guns drawn, thinking that they've just killed two innocent people. Arresting them, they're taken into police custody while their co-worker watches nervously in the background. Meanwhile, her husband Juan and his friend Titi arrive at the branch where they work, but when they see the horses running free, they realize something is wrong. Getting out of the car, the men head to the house where they can hear someone talking. Looking around the corner, Juan here sees a group of perjurers and realizes they're about to execute his employer along with his entire family. The leader here takes off his mask and tells them that there's going to be a revolution. The purge will never end and the rich must now pay for their crimes. It's a hell of a speech, but he never notices that behind them, the immigrants have their guns drawn and are getting into position. Noticing the workers, the old man creates a distraction and accuses the leader of being a hypocrite, pointing out that by continuing the purge, they're just supporting a system designed to eliminate people just like him. Losing his temper, the leader has heard enough and shoots the old man in the head, but that's when Juan and his friend come out to attack. Rushing forward, they take the purgers completely by surprise, killing their leader as the rest of them retreat into the house. The worker here unties the rest of the family to set them free, but they're not safe here. With gunfire echoing the distance, the group sees trucks full of purgers on their way to the ranch, and the survivors have no choice but to leave. They sprint for a Mack truck parked nearby, and all of them get inside, driving out of there before the purgers can gun them down. Okay, this situation could have gone a lot worse, because everyone managed to survive except for this old guy, but the truth is, they're better off without him. This man was literally saying that he speaks for the whole family when he told the perjurer to go f*** himself. Talking like this is just going to get everyone killed faster, and if I was this cowboy here, I'd tell the perjurer to shoot this man just to shut him up. The truth is, if he wanted to stall for time, an FBI hostage negotiator would tell you that it's better to get them talking about themselves. If you look at the situation, it's immediately clear that this guy wants to talk. He's lined up the whole family and given them a long speech about inequality and economic oppression. To him, this is an ideological battle, and that means what he really wants is to be understood. Now this might sound far-fetched, but it's a proven tactic with real science to back it up. Mirror neurons are one of the most important discoveries in the last decade of neuroscience, because experts have discovered that they control a wide range of involuntary human behavior. If we can engage this guy's mirror neurons by appearing to be understanding and likable, we just might be able to survive. Because there's tons of scientific evidence that emotions are intertwined in all of our decisions. Even Wall Street traders use this to make million dollar deals every day. This concept is used very effectively as a tool that hostage negotiators call tactical empathy. And it's exactly what we should be using to create a better distraction. Right now, all we need to do is stall for more time because the workers are already behind them and waiting for the chance to strike. The only reason this man was shot was because he told them to f*** off. So I would have encouraged the man to continue talking by repeating his points back to him as a sign that I'm paying attention. This would have been a much better distraction and Juan here would have had more time to sneak up for a better attack to save everyone. The group heads into town and turns on the radio to find out that violence has broken out across the country. An army of revolutionaries are killing everyone in an endless purge, and it's absolutely horrifying. That's when this man gets a call, with news that his wife has just been arrested and is headed to the police station. The group drives to the suburbs and find that the roads are blocked, but Juan tells them he can walk to the station by himself. The cowboy agrees to wait here until he gets back, and the group splits up, with Juan leading the others to find his wife. After the other survivors leave, the cowboy looks in the mirror, noticing a masked man walking by, and he suddenly realizes that they're both in danger. He gives his wife a gun for protection, telling her to lock the doors, and goes outside to hunt the perjurers. All of a sudden, the masked man appears at the window, startling the woman, and he tries to break in, but at the last second, her husband guns him down. 
That's when another perjurer attacks him from behind, but luckily, he manages to fight him off before swinging a sledgehammer straight into the maniac's head. Meanwhile, Adela and her boss are stuck in the back of a police van with two other perjurers. They race through the streets trying to avoid the chaos, and the cops call for backup, but it's too late. Someone fires an RPG at them, killing the policemen and sending the van spinning out of control. It lands in the middle of the street where chaos is broken out, but inside the van, Adela here has survived the crash. Suddenly, the doors open and her husband Juan is standing on the other side. Relieved he's still alive, she gets out of the van and they run across the road as the Mack truck pulls up beside them. The group gets in and leaves the burning city behind, but they'll soon discover that this purge is much bigger than they could ever imagine. Okay, this is absolutely terrifying, because if the whole country looks just like this, then driving around in a truck is going to get us killed. We need to find the closest place that's safe enough to hide, and for me, that would be this guy's house. The cowboy literally has a ranch on the outskirts of town with the best security system money can buy. It's managed to survive the purge every single year, and is designed to keep out small raiding parties just like this. It's no guarantee, but right now everything is a risk, and I'd much rather fight to protect a fortified home than to wander the streets during an endless purge. Now, it's important to point out that all of these problems could have been completely avoided if you just left the country. This cowboy is clearly wealthy, and with that kind of money, there's no good reason he should stay in America during the purge. But this is not an option for the majority of people. The purpose of the purge is to target economically disadvantaged citizens, and most of them won't have access to a bunker or be able to afford a death free vacation every year. Plane tickets on purge day would be priced ridiculously high, and every road out of the country would have millions of Americans attempting to leave at the same time. The poorest people would be stranded and just had to find a way to survive. This cowboy is not one of those people, and if he had thought ahead to protect his family, he wouldn't even be in this situation. Now earlier, this man was brave enough to get out of his truck to go and hunt down the purgers, and when I say brave, I mean stupid. He didn't need to go outside at all, because this beast of a vehicle is no match for two stray purgers, and it's much safer to wait inside. If you look down the street here, you can tell there's nothing else going on in this part of town, so it would have made a lot more sense to drive around the block and circle back when the purgers leave. Now, if he had to get out of the car, this man found the worst possible way to protect himself. When he steps outside, he didn't consider that the sound of him opening and closing the door will be heard by the purgers, so they'll know exactly where he is and what he's doing. If I were him, I would have looked under the truck to see their feet, and that way I'll know their exact positions on the other side of the vehicle. There's not very much vertical space here between the ground and the truck, but it might be enough to shoot at their legs and injure them. This was a technique that was famously used by SWAT team member Donnie Anderson in the 1997 North Hollywood shootout, where the cop managed to shoot a bank robber who was hiding behind a car. Now, if the truck is too low to the ground and we can't see the purger's feet, instead of walking around the truck like this guy, I would walk away from it. Since the threats can only come from two sides, putting distance between yourself and the vehicle will make the field of view much more narrow and you'll be able to see both positions in a single glance. When they come around the corner, you'll be able to react more quickly and that's way better than what this man is doing. Later that day, the group stops at a motel to scavenge for supplies. When a breaking news headline appears on the TV, reporting that the entire United States is under martial law and soldiers will be sent into every city to deal with the purgers. Outside, the immigrant tries to make a call, but can't get any phone signal and tells the cowboy that the cell towers are being cut down. His wife Adela walks up to them and tells the men that cities everywhere are being overrun by purgers. There's no place left in America that's safe for them to go, and no way to get help. Back inside, the cowboy sister finds a purge flag and looks for anything else they could use when suddenly the radio starts playing a Mexican broadcast. Juan's friend listens to it and realizes this information could save their lives. Bringing it outside for the others to listen, a news report announces that both Mexico and Canada are opening their borders until the purge has calmed down, but there's one catch. The borders will be closing in six hours, and with no other option, they decide their only choice is to head to Mexico. That night, they drive to the border with only three and a half hours left until it closes. The only people still awake are Juan and the cowboy, but the silence is interrupted when they see trouble in the rearview mirror. A group of purgers on motorcycles start shooting at them, and it wakes up the others in a panic. Surrounding the vehicle, the purgers demand they pull the truck over, but that's when the cowboy sister sees the purge flag they took and gets a clever idea. She holds it against the window to make them think they're on the same side, and luckily, the purgers take the bait. The group is left alone and they continue on their way to the border, but things are about to get much more dangerous from here on out. Okay. 
this woman was smart to hold up the flag, but they honestly should have thought of this before leaving the motel. Now, as ridiculous as it sounds, this was a very common tactic used in the Revolutionary War, where colonists would take the uniforms of British soldiers and pose as messengers to pass through enemy territories. If we want to avoid being attacked for the entire trip, we need to use this concept and take it one step further. I would have tried painting the truck with the Forever Purge symbol and fly their flag from the back of the vehicle. We will draw much less attention to ourselves if we look like the enemy, and it will help us drive on the roads without being disturbed. I would even suggest that we dress to look like purgers, so if there's any common outfit they're using, like masks with bullets sewed into them, this would go a long way in helping us travel through the country. Now with that said, going to El Paso is still a terrible idea. El Paso is already the second busiest border in the United States, with over 12 million vehicles crossing each year, so it's going to be packed with citizens desperate to escape. A situation like that is guaranteed to attract purgers because they know they'll find people to kill there, and it won't take long for it to turn into a complete disaster. The next problem is, even if you did manage to cross the border, once you're on the other side, you've entered the notorious city of Juarez, which has the second highest murder rate in the entire world. This city's under constant urban warfare fueled by rival drug gangs, and that's not the kind of refuge I would be looking for. Since going to the border is clearly a terrible idea, we should be looking at alternatives. Now, when every extra mile you drive puts you in more danger, picking the right destination could be a life or death decision. First of all, this truck here is a Western Star 5700 XE, which has a 150 gallon fuel tank and is actually one of the most efficient trucks of its kind, so they probably won't need to be stopping for gas. Right now, our best chance of surviving is to drive somewhere close to minimize risk, and the fewer people there are around you, the less likely you will be to encounter purgers. If you rank all of the states by population density, you'll find that right near the bottom of the list is New Mexico, which borders Texas. It just so happens that 100 miles north of El Paso is a military base called White Sands Missile Range, which is the largest fully instrumented open-air missile range in the country. There's no f***ing way that the US government will let purgers take thousands of missiles from the Department of Defense, so you can guarantee this place will be heavily fortified with military presence. In a low population density state with one of the most protected government facilities in the area, I would take my chances and try looking for refuge here instead of bum rushing to the border with thousands of desperate citizens lighting up for purgers to kill. The survivors finally reach El Paso with only three hours left until the borders close, but as they drive through the streets, they find it looks like a war zone. The city is burning and the military has moved in with tanks, but there aren't enough men to retake control. The cowboy slowly drives through the city and he turns the corner finding that the road to the border has been blocked. With the Mack truck taking too much damage, the group realizes they need to get out on foot if they want a chance of making it to Mexico in time, so the survivors leave the vehicle and start walking to the border. With guns raised, they quickly move through the streets, shooting down any purgers that get in their way, but the chaos is too dangerous. Spotting a movie theater, they rush towards it as fast as they can, but a tank rolling down the street fires at them. The explosion sends the men falling to the ground, but luckily, they manage to survive. When Juan here gets back up, he walks over to the theater to check on his wife, but discovers that she's trapped inside with no way to break out. The group has to split up, and the men tell them they'll go around while the women look for another way to escape. Searching for an exit, they reach the back of the theater and walk outside to find themselves in an alley. Peeking around a corner, their husbands are nowhere in sight. But that's when Adela here notices a rose spray painted on the wall and realizes it has a secret meaning. Meanwhile, the men are advancing forward when they notice another rose. Juan tells the cowboy that this is a symbol that Mexicans leave to help each other find safety and knows that Adela will also follow them. The only way they'll find their wives is to stay on the trail, but they never notice that someone is watching them from the shadows. Okay, like I said earlier, going to El Paso was a terrible idea. The purgers have turned the city into a war zone, which makes this the most dangerous place to be. Now, I can't blame them for trying to flee the country, but there was one decision that was absolutely unforgivable. When Adela here got stuck behind this locked door, her husband acted like he couldn't do anything about it. Now, this man is either an idiot or a liar because he had a loaded M4 rifle in his hands, and all it would have taken was a burst of rounds to blow a hole in the door frame. Instead, he decided it wasn't worth trying, which officially makes this the worst breakup attempt I've ever seen. Now, you might be surprised that these purgers are able to do so much damage even when they're up against the most powerful military force in the world. The Department of Defense's budget is over $700 billion, and they can spend it however they see fit. With that much power and resources at their disposal, it's pretty embarrassing that a network of purgers have completely blindsided them. To be fair though, since the Forever Purge has only been active for 12 hours, you might be able to argue that there hasn't been much time to mobilize military troops across the country. There are roughly 2,400 border agents in the El Paso sector, 
but it covers 11 stations and the entire 268 mile borderline here. They can't all leave their stations to join the battle, but there are better ways for a government to deal with a situation like this, and they're called counterinsurgency tactics. First, separate the guerrillas from the population that supports it. Second, occupy strategic zones so the guerrillas can't travel easily. Third, coordinate actions over a wide enough area that the guerrillas can't access the populations that could support them. These simple rules have been used to fight uprisings throughout history, and they're extremely effective. With the Mexican and Canadian borders opening up to civilians, they're using what's called a drain the sea tactic. This is designed to relocate the civilian population and deprive the purgers of support, cover, and resources. But six hours is not enough to get this done. Since there hasn't been very much time to mobilize troops, what they could have done to slow down the chaos is take out the internet and cell towers, as well as specific roads and bridges so the purgers can't communicate with each other, or gather across the country to organize themselves. These strategies would strike a massive blow to their revolution, and it gives the military more time to mobilize troops and stabilize the chaos. The survivors follow the Trail of Roses, but as they're making their way through an alley, the group is stopped by a gang of purgers. There's no escape, and the leader here orders them to drop their guns, or else they'll be shot. With no other option, the group obeys and puts their weapons on the ground. Seeing the immigrants with them, the leader makes an offer to the cowboy. If he kills the Mexicans and his group, the man can live, but the cowboy rejects his offer, refusing to betray his friends, and this makes the leader's wife furious. She decides to persuade them the hard way and pulls at her gun, shooting TT in the stomach. He collapses to the ground, and the others can do nothing but watch him die. Suddenly, a squad of soldiers get into position behind them and order the purgers to lay down their weapons. The gang starts firing at the soldiers and calls for backup, but when the leader's wife tries to shoot Juan, he wrestles with her and turns the gun back to avenge his dead friend. The survivors take their chances and run for their lives, leaving the purgers in the alley as they wipe out the remaining soldiers. Seeing his dead wife on the ground, the leader is devastated, but swears revenge on the survivors and orders his men to hunt them down. Meanwhile, the two women are still following the Trail of Roses, and it leads them to a building in the middle of the city. Walking inside, they're led into a shelter full of other people hiding from the chaos, and Juan runs up to give her a hug, relieved that his wife is still alive. The whole group has finally reunited, but things are about to get much worse. A news report appears on the TV, announcing that a military base in El Paso has been attacked, and all the soldiers have been pulled out of the city. In response, Mexico has closed their borders, leaving everyone here stranded, but there's one last hope. This old woman tells one of the guards to find a man named Chiago, promising he's the only man who can help them get out alive. Okay, in a single night, the entire country has been taken over by an army of purgers, and while this is absolutely terrifying, we really can't be surprised. If all murder was legal for one day a year, like-minded people will band together and target their violence towards other groups that they hate. Violence can appear to be random, but hate never is. And statistically, the poorest people in urban America are overwhelmingly minority groups who won't have the money to defend themselves during the purge. Now, since this is such a predictable dynamic, the government should know that these purges are the perfect setup to allow hate groups to organize and develop deep networks of influence on purge day. What they didn't realize was that this exact dynamic has historically toppled governments and caused permanent shifts in power for the last 500 years. The truth is, the most impactful thing you can do during the purge is not to kill others, it's to acquire power. Leading historians believe that social networks have been the backbone of revolution before the internet even existed. When the Catholic Church dominated European culture, it was the network of Protestants that used the printing press to spread their ideas and it changed the world. Now, if the government had been paying attention, they would have seen the signs that this would happen. If you look here, you'll see that there are symbols of this forever purge all over town, and it's even on the water tower that looms over the city. If they already have this much presence, you have to assume there's a lot of propaganda on social networking sites to help them spread this message. It's the perfect example to show us that the most successful wars are fought to gain the support of the population, not just control of territory. These symbols of the Forever Purge were the telltale signs that revolt was stirring, and if the government had seen these and addressed them earlier, they might have been able to prevent this from happening. Later, the survivors wait outside as a truck pulls into the alley, and the group point their guns, ready to take down any purgers, but then the old woman walks up to the vehicle. She begs his Native American man, Chiago, to take them to Mexico, and he agrees, allowing the survivors to get into his truck with no time to waste. Meanwhile, the purge leader gets a message over the radio, telling him that a group of citizens are trying to cross the border through the Indian reservation. He realizes that the immigrant who killed his wife could be with them, and this is the perfect opportunity to get revenge. 
The next morning, Chiago's truck is driving through the desert as all the survivors are taken to a secret route to Mexico. Suddenly, the cowboy's wife gasps in pain and they all realize that she's about to go into labor. The wife is nervous, but the older woman reassures her that she'll get help over the border. That's when the sister takes a look outside and spots dust clouds in the distance. The purgers have found them and their leader is going to do whatever it takes to hunt them down. The truck arrives at an encampment where the other tribe members are waiting for them and the survivors get out as they continue the journey on foot. The cowboy tells his wife she'll have to cross the border without him. Even though she wants him to go with her, he convinces the women to leave him behind. Together, they sit down onto the sled and are carried up this hill, leaving their friends to face the army of purgers. The survivors grab their weapon of choice and get into position, but as the purgers approach, all hell breaks loose. One of the tribesmen fires an explosive arrow and sends a truck flying through the air, killing the passengers inside. The survivors manage to take them down one by one, but there's too many and the group begins to run out of ammo. As the purgers move closer, the survivors have no choice but to retreat, and as the gang sneak up to the encampment to finish the job, they discover their targets are already gone. Okay, these Native Americans are f***ing awesome. They had no reason to put their lives in danger to come save these people, and it was a very honorable decision. Now with that said, we need to leave these guys behind. Honor is no use to a dead man, and if there's a way across the border, then we should be on that ski lift before the fighting even begins. I'd rather be alive in Mexico than dead in America. This guy with the exploding arrows was doing a great job distracting the entire Perger army, and I would have suggested he stay behind to help everyone else get to safety. Now, if we had no choice but to fight, I would have tried things a little bit differently. I've obviously never been in a shootout before, but it's fair to assume that the high ground is going to give you the advantage here. You can see the entire Purge army, and it might be easier to kill them for this position. But there's one problem. This mountainside doesn't have enough cover to avoid enemy fire, and some of the weapons they're using aren't designed for long-range shooting. They would have better sight of their enemies, but their accuracy would still drop because of the long distance. If I were in this situation, I would have considered two alternative strategies with historical events to back them up. The first is to have everyone grab a vehicle and drive them out into battle. It might sound counterintuitive, but with one person driving and the other person shooting, it's actually much safer than being in a fixed position because a moving target is always harder to hit. This strategy was actually used to enormously great effect by the chatting armed forces in the Great Toyota War of 1987. The name comes from the Toyota pickup trucks that the Chadian army used against the Libyans, and they managed to kill 7,500 enemy combatants while they lost only 1,000. Now, this strategy might not work if these vehicles are too run down to be driving through the desert. They don't look like they're in great shape, but we can still use them to our advantage. Right now, it's way too easy for one of these purgers to sneak off to the side and flank the group from behind. So I would suggest we take all these cars and move them into a circle for 360 degrees of protection. This strategy is very similar to the one used in the Johnson County War in 1893, where a posse of 200 ranchers had a standoff against cattle monopolies in the Wild West. It's uncertain exactly how much of the stories mythologized, but they barricaded themselves into a circle and built battering rams to attack the enemy, managing to last three full days. Either of these strategies would have been safer, but when you have this much plot armor, anything will work. The survivors run up the mountain to this abandoned house and take cover inside, but they've cornered themselves in and the gunmen are on their way. The Native American leader looks inside one of the rooms, finding these animal skulls hanging on the wall, and it gives the man a clever idea. Moments later, purgers start to enter the building and search for the survivors, but they get ambushed by the Native Americans who take them down easily. Suddenly, a motorbike breaks through the building and Juan here is pushed out of the way by his wife, but she gets hit and falls to the ground unconscious. The purger revs his engine and drives straight for the immigrant, but the cowboy manages to knock the rider off his bike. More purgers come inside the building armed to the teeth and attack the survivors. One of them drags Juan here to the motorcycle and is about to push his face into the spinning wheel, but that's when his wife wakes up. Seeing her husband is in trouble, Adela here reaches for a gun nearby and manages to shoot the purger right in the face. But suddenly, the leader comes crashing through the boards behind her and yanks her straight out of the window. He holds a knife to her throat, keeping the woman hostage, and orders Adela to call her husband for help. Instead, she yells in Spanish to kill the leader, and that's when this lasso comes flying in, looping itself around the man's neck. Working together, the men disarm him and pull him to the ground where he can only stare helplessly at Juan, who takes out his gun and shoots him straight in the head. With all the purgers who were chasing them now dead, the group crosses over the border and enters a refugee camp where the cowboy reunites with his wife. She's given birth to their first child, and the Mexicans congratulate him on becoming a father. It's a happy ending for everyone except for 300 million Americans who are now stuck in a burning hellhole without internet. 
But what do you think? How would you beat the Forever Purge? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How To Be playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.